Well, hello there. As persons begin to learn the attributes of God as classically understood, they often find very quickly that many modern theologians disagree strongly with the classic portrayal of God. And they begin to wonder, why is it that modern theologians think so differently from classical theologians about the nature of God? Many of the classic attributes of God are strongly contested in today's world. For example, the classic doctrine of simplicity, that God is absolute, he is pure act, that he is the fullness of what he is, is often contested. Maybe God is becoming along with creation. Maybe God is growing as creation grows. The doctrine of self-sufficiency, that God is absolute in himself without the need of creation, is often contested. Maybe God actually needs creation to become himself. Immutability and impassibility, that God does not change or that God is not impacted by his creation in a way that changes him, are often seen as laughable doctrines. How could it be that God doesn't change if he's really in relationship with us? And there's questions about God's omnipotence. Is God really all-powerful in the sense that he could control everything? Is he really all-knowing in the sense that he knows everything about the future and how things will turn out? All of these questions are wrestled with in modern theology. Now, I'm not going to decide which is right, modern theology or classic theology. I'm simply going to show why the landscape has changed and why persons think about God differently today than they did in the classic period. I'm going to say that the Copernican revolution in how persons think about God has come really from three H sources. The first one is Hegel, the philosopher, lived around the year 1800. The second is the Holocaust, the middle of the 20th century. And third is what's called the Hellenization thesis, started by a guy named Harnack, that questions whether our language about God really comes from the Bible or is more influenced by Greek thought. Let's look at each one of these individually. The first change came from a philosopher named George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. And Hegel is really the first philosopher to take history really seriously. And for Hegel, it's important to take history really seriously because what he sees happening is that mind or idea is becoming itself in the process of history. And as Hegel understands it, God is becoming God's self as God creates and works himself out in the process of history. And so for Hegel, God must create creation in order to become himself as he interacts with creation. A couple of other interesting ideas here. First is panentheism. Hegel holds that God must create the universe. He must have a creation in order to get to know himself. And so God would not be independent by himself. He must have creation in order that through the process of interaction with creation, God will finally come to be his fullest being. Now, Hegel sees that all human beings actually operate that way. We come to know ourselves through others. And we come to know ourselves through our through some kind of an interaction with our external circumstances. And Hegel says, well, it must be like that for God as well. God becomes himself through the process of history. And so Hegel is going to emphasize that there's a dynamic relationship between God and history that must happen so that God becomes along with us. Hegel understands this in a very Trinitarian way. That is that God the Father creates an other so that he can come to know himself. And so God must create so that God can come to know God's self. And the process of history is the process of God coming to be as God gets to relate with his creation, gets to know himself in his creation. Of course, the ultimate moment for Hegel here is the incarnation, the symbol of God becoming 
man or of God becoming his creation. Reconciliation has taken place. God has posited an other and now God has become his other. He's worked out the difference and in that process he's become more fully himself. Now Hegel sees that process repeating. The Holy Spirit is the chief operator in this age in which we live, and the Holy Spirit is coming to reconciliation with our spirit. For Hegel, that means our collective spirit as human beings, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age of all human beings, and he sees this worked out in the state, in modern society, and he believes all of this is moving toward his philosophy. The point for us is that there's a dynamic interaction between God and us, the divine spirit and the human spirit that continues to work itself out in history as God becomes God in his relationship with his creation. Now, we might notice that Hegel has redefined a lot of Christian language here. Creation is simply God's other. God had to posit an other to become himself. And for Hegel, the fall is a good thing. It's an inevitably good thing because God could not get to know his other unless there was some kind of disharmony with the other that he could reconcile himself toward. And so the incarnation is specifically that reconciliation. The atonement then is God's suffering to become God as God suffers for his other and becomes one with his other. And so the symbols of Father, Son, and Spirit are God becoming God's self in relation to creation. What we see then are two things. God is becoming in history as God becomes one with his creation. Furthermore, then God, of course, needs his creation to be himself. As God creates and is reconciled to creation, God grows. And that process is a necessary one for Hegel. Now, Hegel, then, is the first to really provide a dynamic ontology of God, one in which God's being is becoming along with creation. Now, this becomes extremely important after evolutionary theory, after quantum physics, as the age of the earth and as the age of the universe are understood, as the process of life development is taken more seriously in evolutionary models, Dynamic ontology seems to be needed between God and creation. It just seems to make sense that God becomes himself over the course of time as he relates to his creation. He allows his creation to work itself out over many, many millions and billions of years, and God himself interacts and becomes himself through that process. The modern world is fixated on that process of change and seems to understand God as being involved in that process of change himself as he's becoming himself in relation to creation. The second issue of the modern world is the Holocaust. That most horrible moment in human history in which so many millions of persons were exterminated by one nation claiming itself to be a Christian nation. To heighten that problem, many of those who were killed and were intentionally targeted were Jews, and they claimed themselves to be God's chosen people. And so inherently, the problem of the Holocaust is a religious problem, because it is a group of persons of one religion claiming to be God's people who are being exterminated by another group of persons who are claiming to be God's people who are Christians. The Holocaust has played deeply on the Christian theological imagination, and maybe the best symbol of the Holocaust comes in Elie Wiesel's very influential book, Night, where he describes watching a young boy be hanged in a concentration camp, and as the members of the concentration camp himself included have to walk by that boy as he's dying. He hears someone behind him saying, for God's sake, where is God? And Elie Wiesel says, from within me, I heard a voice answer, where is he? Where is God? This is where he's hanging from this gallows. It's a powerful image, and it gets at the essential horror of the Holocaust that Elie Wiesel is saying that God is a God who, if he exists, must be there in the middle of suffering. God himself must be suffering along with creation if God is to be a good God who exists in the midst of this kind of suffering. 
Another powerful image comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, himself a person who was hanged in a concentration camp for his attempt to overthrow Hitler. Bonhoeffer, in his last days being tortured by the Gestapo, says in his letters, the Bible directs man toward God's powerlessness and suffering. He says only a suffering God can help. And Bonhoeffer found in that torture and in those last days comfort and stability in the idea that God suffers and that God had suffered for him. And this captures the theological imagination of life after the Holocaust. How can it be that God could allow that kind of suffering? Well, theologians reason only if God suffered with and in the midst of that suffering itself. And so theologies of the Holocaust or theologies after the Holocaust have developed that have emphasized the need for suffering in God. And Daniel Costello says, well, here in this portrayal, in theologies after and of the Holocaust, the category of suffering comes to have a non-negotiable value all unto its own so that one's doctrine of God subsequently requires modification in some significant way. It cannot be said anymore, theologians say, that God is impassable, that God is somehow not affected or not changed by human suffering. It cannot be said that God is immutable, that God does not change. It must be said if God is going to be claimed to be good and all-powerful, that somehow he has to be suffering along with human suffering and affected by human beings. A real Copernican revolution has taken place then in how modern people look at God versus how persons in the classic period looked at the nature of God. The modern person sees God as something of a problem. And it could be a problem put in these four premises that God exists, God is all good, God is all powerful, and evil exists. And there seems to be something wrong in these premises that they can't all hold together. If God exists and is all good and all powerful, then how is it that evil can exist? Maybe it is that God isn't all good, or maybe it is that God isn't all powerful, and maybe it is that God just simply doesn't exist. It's important to note that the classical problem of God is very different. <laughs> the way that the classical Christians thought about God was this, given that God is all good and all powerful, well then, what is evil in the first place? And so they started that way and tried to figure out what evil must be if God is all good and all powerful. Notice how the question has turned around. C.S. Lewis gets at this very perceptively in his book, God in the Dock. Lewis says this, the ancient man approached God or even the gods as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. Modern man is a quite kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God that permits war, poverty, and disease, he's ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. And theologies after the Holocaust usually tend in that direction of finding some excuse for God allowing the suffering that we see in this world. And that trend seems to continue. The final Copernican revolution in thinking about God has often been associated with what's called the Hellenization thesis. And that is the idea that the early Christians were Bible-believing Christians, and then as they reached out to the Greeks and as they interacted with the Greeks, their theological language became more and more Greek. And so over the course of the first few centuries, the church moved from scriptural language which emphasized the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to a language of abstract philosophical thought about God, where God is now the simple one, and he's the impassable one, and he's the immutable one, and he's the unmoved mover. And those terms, they say, are not biblical terms. They're terms forced on us by Greek thought. And Christians today must go back and decide whether they want the God of the Bible or the God of the Greeks.
Now, the Hellenization thesis usually works like this. The claim is that early Christians living in a Greek environment were doing what Christians ought to be doing. They were reaching out to the Greeks with the gospel. They were trying to make it make sense to the Greeks. And so they had to use Greek terms to help Greeks understand what Christianity was all about. The problem is that over the course of time, Greeks became Christians. They were still thinking in their Greek language. They never made the shift over to real biblical Christianity. And so pretty soon the whole church began thinking in Greek concepts. And so we get many Greek concepts that are part of our Christian faith that the claim is were not part of the Bible. Homo usius. Usia, being, hypostasis, these are not terms in the Bible. These are terms added from Greek thought, the claim goes. And furthermore, the doctrines of simplicity, impassibility, this was an ideal Greek God, the claim is, and it doesn't really reflect the relationality of the biblical God. And so the claim is that we're forced to choose between the biblical God and the Greek God and in that decision, one will decide whether to be a biblical Christian or a classical or medieval Christian. So these are the three Copernican revolutions that have seemed to take place in modern thought that really do shift the way modern persons think about God versus the way classical Christians had thought about God. And by classical, I mean anything before the Enlightenment. Now, all of these three H words seem to me to be a little bit overplayed in today's modern world. The Hellenization thesis in many ways is just simply false and has been rebutted in a lot of areas. The Holocaust seems to be dealing with a problem on a greater scale, yes, but a problem that has always existed in human history, and that is the problem of suffering. And Hegel's thought should not be seen as a replacement automatically to Greek thought simply because it's newer. And so if we keep that in balance, there may still be something really important about the classical attributes of God that we need to keep and that our Christianity needs to continue to reflect upon. But this is why these attributes are often seen as being out of fashion today.